So we're going through the start of the book of Genesis, thinking about God creating the world and then the foundational stories of the whole rest of the Bible. And I told you last time that there's something that you really should learn to remember, which is what God made on each day of creation. Okay, did you really think I wasn't going to bring that up today? All right, so I said there's just six days. Right? And there's a really nice order to how God does everything. So, take a minute, just on your own. See if you can rattle through what God made on each day of creation. sky. Day three, land and seas, although it seems like the seas were already there. So we really we made the dry land, gathered the water and the seas, and what else? Vegetation. Vegetation. So he makes dry land and fills it up with plants right away. Day four, stars. sun, moon, and stars. Day five, birds and fish. And finally, day six, land animals and people, and human beings. That's not hard at all, is it? I'm not going to keep challenging you. You can remember this. All right, God had a very orderly creation. We can remember what he made on each day. All right. So we made it through the first two chapters of Genesis. How do Genesis 1 and Genesis chapter 2 work together to tell the same story? Can someone explain to me how they fit together? I told you that a lot of people today said they don't fit together. This is just two random stories that some guy jammed together in the Bible that don't go together. It's of course not what we believe. It's, it's one story. But how do they fit together? Genesis 2 fits, uh, focuses on the sixth day. Excellent. So Genesis chapter 1 gives us this overview of all seven days of creation, ending with God resting on the seventh day. And then in chapter 2, the Bible focuses in on what the Bible says is the most important part of God's creation, which was? People, Adam and Eve. And so Genesis chapter 2, it's not a different story. It's as the things in chapter 1 were happening, here's what God did in a special way for Adam and Eve, how he made man and then how he made woman. Understand that? Okay. What's the Bible's definition of marriage from Genesis 2 verse 24? Now I've already kind of challenged you maybe enough tonight, but this is a verse that you could remember, like memorize. Excellent. There's a little bit of a paraphrase, and we'll go with that tonight. A man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. And if you were here last week, we looked at how that passage is repeated at least three times in the New Testament. 
in different places. And this is what marriage is. It's a man and a woman. They're leaving their, their parents, not abandoning them, but they're starting their own family. They're going to be united and live as one. And when God's joined together, let people not separate. This is what the Bible teaches about marriage. All right? Why is it important to see that marriage was a part of God's perfect creation before sin entered the world? God established it. So according to the Bible, marriage isn't just something that, you know, people came up with. It wasn't just that, you know, over trial and error, some people thought, well, you know, if a man and a woman get married, that usually works out okay. That's not how it happened. God, from the very beginning, said, I'm going to make a man and a woman, and my goal is for them to be married. Good. What else do we, we learn from this that there was marriage even before there was sin in the world. So this having children and filling up the earth, that was always God's plan. How about just as simple as this, is marriage a good thing? You're really slow to answer that. <laughs> when, he had, when he made animals or birds, he always made a, two of them, a partner. Yeah. And so, yeah, excellent. And so God showed Adam all those animals to let them see that they were male and female, all the different animals. And the simple point I'm trying to make is that according to the Bible, marriage is a really good thing. And we don't always look at it that way. A lot of people don't look at it that way. But according to the Bible, even if the world was absolutely perfect, there would still be people getting married. That was his plan all along. We said last week that a lot of what happens in life is a result of sin. That's what we're going to hear today. But marriage is one thing that still remains from the perfect world. It's a good thing when a man and a woman commit to each other before God in a marriage. All right, one more slide to get us into today. When God finished creating everything, it was very good. Very good. All right, if you go along in Genesis chapter 1, and after each day it says it was good, it was good, it was good. But then when you get to the end of the sixth day, then it was very good. So after the sixth day, after everything's made, Adam and Eve are made, everything is very good. Is the world that way today? Would you look around and say, you know, the world... It is very good. I would say it is. I mean, I mean, you've got the seasons, you've got the beautiful countries, you know. Wow. But that's a very positive attitude. <laughs> that, that's wonderful. Well, there's a lot of blessings from God in our world today. Yeah. That's absolutely true. I think so. And we should see those things. Right. But. <laughs> yes, I do. If we just look around, is everything very good? No. And that is the answer is no. And that's what we're going to talk about tonight. How was it that when God made the world, it was perfect? And now we look around and it's not perfect. And what happened? And that's what we find in Genesis chapter 3. So open up to Genesis chapter 3 if you're not there already. And in Genesis chapter 3, we have the story of the fall. All right, we're going to take our time going through this. So if you have any questions as we go along, feel free to bring them up. Let's just read the first verse. Genesis chapter 3, verse 1. It says, Now the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? Let's just stop there. So suddenly, there's a serpent, a snake, that's talking. Which is a sign that this isn't just a snake, although it was a snake, but it wasn't just a snake. Someone had taken the form of a serpent. Who did it? Satan. Okay, from the rest of the Bible story, 
we learn that Satan, the devil, took the form of a serpent, a snake, to tempt Adam and Eve. Where did Satan come from? Yeah, is it kind of interesting that it doesn't tell us? I mean, Genesis chapter 3 doesn't tell us. We hear lots of details about the creation and people, and Genesis chapter 3 doesn't tell us. It just says, here is this figure, and it's obviously not good. Obviously not on God's side. And I think maybe one of the things that surprises us in the Bible is the Bible doesn't tell us as much about angels and demons as we would think that it would. Right? The Bible doesn't specifically say, well, on this day, God made the angels. He, he must have. But it doesn't tell us that. Come on in. The Bible also doesn't have a long, detailed description of, well, here's what happened in heaven when the devil rebelled against God, and then he got removed from heaven, and here's the whole story. And We don't find that anywhere in the Bible. Why do you think the Bible doesn't go into all those details? So ultimately, it must not matter to us. What's the Bible's message all about? Salvation. Salvation for who? For people. For human beings. And so the Bible isn't the story of, well, here's how God deals with the spiritual beings that he created. It's this is how God deals with human beings. And so we hear about angels, and we hear about demons, and we hear about the devil. But nowhere in the Bible does God explain that spiritual world maybe as much as we might like him to. And clearly that's saying it's things that we don't need to know. When you get to the New Testament, there are a few passages that give us some hints about what happened with the devil. So 2 Peter 2 verse 4, now we're waiting toward the end of the New Testament. It said, For if God did not spare angels when they sinned, but sent them to hell, putting them in chains of darkness to be held for judgment. And it goes on to talk about God's judgment on people too. Just from this one verse, it's just one verse. It's not, there's not a bigger context talking about what happened. What do we hear about in this one verse? There's angels, and they seem like they were all good, right? There were angels, there's, and they're all good, which fits with God creating the world, that was very good. And then what did the angels do? When they sinned. They sinned. And we'd be like, Peter, can you elaborate on that a little bit further? <laughs> what? How did this happen? But they sinned. And when they sinned, what did God do? He judged them. He judged them immediately. Good. He judged them immediately. And he sent them to hell. Okay, and so are the demons and the devil, are they in charge of hell? No. Who's in charge of hell? God is. God is. And so the angels were all good and some of them sinned against God and God sent them to hell, which is like darkness and chains and judgment. That's one thing that the Bible says. All right? Jude, that's one the little book right before Revelation at the end of the Bible. It doesn't even have chapters. It just has verses. Jude, verse 6, says, The angels who did not keep their positions of authority, but abandoned their proper dwelling, these he has kept in darkness, bound with everlasting chains for judgment on the great day. Sounds similar to what Second Peter says, right? This maybe adds a little bit more. What was involved in what the angels did that was wrong? Well, it has something to do with authority. And it has something to do with they weren't they weren't happy with their their proper dwelling or their proper position. And so this is where we get the idea. And again, the Bible doesn't spell it out quite the way we'd expect it to, that somehow the devil and other angels, they were all good angels, but they rebelled against God in some way. They weren't content with what God had given to them and what God had made them. And when they rebelled against God, God expelled them from heaven 
and he sent them to hell. And they're waiting in hell for the final judgment on the last day. And for the rest of the Bible, what's their goal? Before that final judgment happens, what do the devil and his demons want to do? get as many people to suffer in hell as they are. Not because they're in control of hell, but kind of like misery loves company. And so they want as many of God's people to suffer in hell like they are. Okay, you follow all this? Here's something that Jesus said. This is in Jesus' story about Judgment Day. The Son of Man is going to come on the clouds and he's going to separate the sheep from the goats. You've heard this story. The goats he's going to take to, not the goats, the sheep. <laughs> Have I heard this story? I think so. The sheep he's going to take to heaven. I was just testing you to see if you were correct. Me. The goats he's going to send to hell. Here's how it's described. Then he will say to those on his left, Depart from me, you who are cursed, into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. And so Jesus' words they actually add one more thing. Right? Why is there a hell? Who, who is it made specifically for? The devil and his angels. And so we get this impression that it's not like there's always been hell, but that when the devil and his angels rebelled against God, God created hell as this place of torment that's really specifically meant for them. And sadly, for all the people that they they bring along in their rejection and rebellion against God. I bet God is very sad that this has happened, that the, that the angels rebelled against him. Yeah, you just think of, we haven't made the whole universe, but you've made something in your life. And how do you feel when you make something and then somebody else wrecks it? And you just think... Ah, that's, that hurts, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. And so, for God to make this perfect world, and then for those angels to rebel, and you think, wow, that doesn't make any sense. And then for them to get people to rebel, that doesn't make any sense. And this is where people talk, you know, if you and I were God, we probably just would have destroyed the whole thing, right? Started over. But what we'll see today, that's not what God did. That God in His grace said, even though the devil and people have messed up my creation so much, I'm gonna I'm gonna keep it going. And I'm gonna send my own son into the world to make things right. And I'm gonna make a new heavens and a new earth where those who believe in me are gonna live. And it's really an amazing story of God's grace. After all that the devil and we've done against God, that God would still show people grace. This is a blessing. One last verse. At the end of Revelation, we hear this. He sees the dragon, that ancient serpent, who is the devil, or Satan. If you were here the last couple of weeks, we've seen how the end of Revelation brings up things from the beginning of Genesis. We heard a positive thing the last time we read from Revelation 22 about in heaven there's a river with the tree of life and it's kind of like the Garden of Eden only way better. The end of the Bible brings up that ancient serpent. Obviously it's talking about Genesis chapter 3 and it, it identifies it for us in case there was any doubt in our minds. Who is the ancient serpent? The devil. The devil. It's Satan. And so here in the Garden of Eden, the devil, who was created to be a perfect angel but rebelled against God, he takes the form of a serpent and he comes and talks to Eve. Any questions about that? People will ask, well, how long did this happen after God made the world? And do we know? No. No. We really don't know. It doesn't tell us. <coughs> Often in the Bible there'll be a after this many years or something like that. We don't have that here. I think usually when people read this, it just seems like it couldn't have taken too long. Uh, there's been some Christians who have said, well, it couldn't have been too long because Eve didn't have any children yet. Yeah. 
But we don't know how old he was when she had children either. And so we're not sure. But it seems like pretty quickly the devil and the demons rebel against God and pretty quickly here is the devil tempting Eve to sin. If you look back at that verse, what tactic did the devil use to tempt Eve to sin? Don't. Right? What are his first four words? Did God really say? Did God really say? What, what his tactic is, is to create doubt in Adam and Eve's mind about God's word. Right? Did God really say? He's creating doubt about God's word. Right? Why would he want to create doubt about God's word? It makes us indecisive. It makes us indecisive, yeah. Kind of fills us with doubt and we waver and right? what's the what's the connection? Why why is it a big deal for the devil to make us doubt God's word? We don't trust it. Exactly. So if you and I don't trust the word of God, whom are we not trusting? We're not trusting God. Right. So notice that the devil doesn't come to, Adam, to Eve and say, oh, do you really believe in God? He doesn't say that. She probably would have said, oh, yes, I do. But he's sneakier than that, right? Did God, did he really say this? And notice what he says, is it what God really said? You must not eat from any tree in the garden. Is that actually what God had said? No. Is there a shred of truth in it? Yes. Yes. So the way he, he creates doubt about God's word is he finds ways to twist it too. And so God had said you can't eat from the one tree and God had given a command about trees. But the devil takes that and he twists it. And did God really say it? So does the devil still use that tactic today? Yes. 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 Could you think of an example of a did God really say and then something from the Bible that the devil calls into question today? Yeah. Did, did, did Jesus die on the cross? Did he really die on the cross? He didn't have any mortal wounds. Did he? Did he really rise from the dead? They were survivable. Did, did he really do that? Really? Did God really say that you can't be? If you're a woman, you can't be with a woman because why would you make that way? Yeah. Did God really say marriage is one man and one woman? Did God really say that sexuality is just supposed to be between a man and a woman in marriage? Right. Did, did God really say that he created male and female? Right? Isn't that the doubts that the devil's putting into our minds? And they always kind of make sense, humanly speaking. But when we start to doubt God's word, who are we really doubting? We're doubting God. You can't turn away from God's word without also turning away from God. Right? So just be aware. If you hear this little, did God really say... Did God really say this is such a big deal? And just kind of red flags should go off. Right? Doubting God's word. This is what the devil does to lead people astray. Let's look at Eve's response. So verses 2 and 3. So the devil said, Did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? The woman said to the serpent, We may eat fruit from the trees in the garden, but God did say, You must not eat fruit from the tree that is in the middle of the garden, and you must not touch it, or you will die. So the devil, did God really say it? He gives a response. Now, I should be honest that sometimes Christians debate Eve's response. Was this a good response or not? I think that Eve's response was an excellent response. And why would I say that? Why would I say Eve gives an excellent response to this temptation? Well, now, the, the sin has been in place now, and so now once that's in place, it's all about us. But, but that's the thing. Sin hasn't been in place she yet. She said what God said. She repeated what she said. Yeah, so 
To me, this is an excellent response because the devil says, did God really say? And he said, yes. no. And then she quotes exactly what God said. And so whenever we're faced with this temptation, well, did God really say, what should we do? We should look, we should, maybe we should look it up first, but we should look up and see what did God really say, and then we should respond to that. All right. But she kind of adds us, you, sh you shouldn't touch it. So this is where people will say, well, but maybe Eve is actually changing God's word or adding to it about this not touching it and But on the other hand, she's putting in, she's putting horrors. If we'll die. I, I think... A couple of responses to that is one, we don't know everything that God said to Adam and Eve. And so certainly God said a lot of things to them that aren't recorded for us in the Bible. And so if Eve responds to the devil by saying, no, here's what God said, I think it's hard for us to say, no, Eve, that's not what God really said. When God certainly said a lot of things to Eve that we haven't heard and People will look up that word, touch it, and you think about fruit on a tree. What is the only reason that you touch fruit on a tree? To pick it. Okay, let's take a What's the only reason you pick it? To eat it. To eat it. And so this idea, why, why would anybody be touching the fruit other than the purpose of eating it? And so... It, it seems like, instead of saying, well, Eve, you're, you're extrapolating on God's word, to say, well, Eve seems to just be repeating back what God said. And to me, the ultimate proof that, that she's saying the right thing is that after she says it, what happens? Right here after verse 3, Eve gives this response, and what happens? Exactly. Nothing happens. All right? Now, at the next temptation the devil gives, Eve is going to take the fruit and eat it, and what happens? Everything falls apart. Okay, that, that's where I, it's really hard to say that Eve sinned in verse 3, because after verse 3... There's no, there's no effect of sin. In fact, the devil has to keep on tempting. Why does the devil need to keep on tempting? Because she hasn't sinned yet. And so I think that the best way to understand this is the devil comes to Eve. Did God really say this? And then he tells a lie, twists God's word. And Eve, as the perfect human being that she was, she pretty boldly says back, no, that's not what God said. God said this, and she repeats the word of God, and it's an excellent response. Can you see why I would say that? Sure. Okay, okay so um, if she, okay, um, to, God said that you would die, but that means that you would die. You have you have sinned against Him, not to be mortally dead. Because generations would have to come along. But um, I lost my train of thought. No, that's a good point to bring up. When God said that if you eat from this tree, you will surely die. But if you're God. dying in sin. And so what God's talking about is real physical death. But the point that you're making is that didn't happen immediately. Mm -hmm. But the result of eating from that tree is that Adam and Eve were going to die. Yeah. Exactly. As long as they didn't eat from that tree, they were going to live forever. The moment they ate from that tree, they, they were going to die. Yeah. It doesn't mean that God put them to death at that moment. No. That was part of His grace. He let them live and have children, and we could be here. But they were going to die. That was that result of, of sin. All right, everybody following along? So the devil comes. He does his tempting. Did God really say, twist God's word? It seems like Eve gives a good answer. She says, here is what God's word says. That's how we want to answer temptations that we're faced. If anyone calls into question God's word, may we be ready to say, no, nope, here is what God's word says. The problem is that does the devil just tempt us one time and then give up? 
No, I, I think this is something that we learn from the story. If we're understanding it correctly, that Eve gives a good answer the first time, we say that's great. The problem is the devil, he tempts us over and over and over and over again. And often in our lives, when we're faced with a temptation the first time, we're able to say, no way. And then the second time, it's kind of, well, I don't know. And then the devil wears us down, right? And so he comes back to Eve another time. Let's read verses 4 and 5. You will not certainly die, the serpent said to the woman, for God knows that when you eat from it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. What's the second tactic that the devil uses to tempt Eve to sin? Put whipped cream on the cake. <laughs> yeah, that's a good way to put it. Put whipped cream on the cake. Right? He makes the sin look good. And what does he make look bad? Or whom does he make look bad? That they would have the knowledge. God, he makes God look bad and sin look good. So first he directly contradicts what God says. No, that's not going to happen. That's a lie. He likes to lie. But then he says, you know, God knows that if you eat of this fruit, it's going to be better for you. And he's making that sin look good. And he's making God look, you know, God, he just doesn't want you to know everything. He's trying to hold you down. He's trying to keep you from the good things that you really could have. Right? And God, He just is not out for the good. If you just were to do this, it would be really good for you. See how He does that? He makes sin look good, and He makes God look like the bad guy. And here, He is the smartest of the wild animals. <laughs> So it says that about the serpent. He's, now he's about to do the smartest people on earth. Yeah, so the, the serpent was crafty. And of course, it's because the devil was working through him. And we can see this. Okay, the devil, he he's an expert at tempting us. Right? So first he's going to try to get us to doubt God's word. And he's going to get us to think sin looks good. And, you know, God's plan, that just he's just not doing what's best for us. How does he use that tactic still today? How does the devil make sin look good and God look bad still today? Well, he... Hollywood? Yeah, so this, you know, you look at who seems to be popular or famous or wealthy. And the devil says, look it, if you just live like them, you would be like that too. Wealthy and popular and famous. And you know God, with all these rules, he's just trying to keep you from having success. He's trying to keep you from having fun. That's what God's doing. Well, so average people that are, let's say young people that instill in others, all oh, come along, it's, you know, we're just having fun, and uh, so not even young, older people too. But <laughs> so, and, and who's working behind all that? The, the devil. The devil is, and this, you know, maybe it's alcohol or drugs, maybe it's sex outside of marriage. It's just the devil says this would be really fun, right? If you were to do this, look at everybody's doing it. Look at how much fun they're having. If you were to do it. You would have fun too. And I know that God says you're not supposed to, but God, you, God's just trying to keep you from having fun. God's trying to keep you from the good things that you could have. Or they twist, like a loving God would never, yeah. you know. Look. If God actually cared about you, yeah. he wouldn't be bothered by this. If God really cared about you, he'd let you do whatever you want, right? That's what a loving God would do it. It's the same temptation that he did in the Garden of Eden. Look at it. This is actually good for you. And God, he's trying to hold you back. And just know the devil, he is crafty. Just like Randy mentioned, that snake, he's crafty. 
and he knows how to get to us and usually the devil he doesn't just say hey you like curse God because he'd know that well I'm not, I don't want to do that but what he says is hey you know there's this thing that when God says it's wrong it's not really wrong you see God he, he just wants to keep you from what's good the thing it's really fun it's going to make your life better and of course, when you actually do it, how do you feel? You feel bad. Maybe good for a little while, and then you feel bad. And then you feel awful, because it's all a lie, right? But just this, you know, if I weren't to be a Christian, life would be more fun. Does that thought ever cross your mind? That's the devil's temptation. Well, it's, it's kind of maybe young people feel it especially, but I don't think older people are any less tempted. Right? If I just let go and do this thing, it's going to be more fun. It's going to be better for me. All right, let's see what happens. Here's the sad part. Verses 6 and 7. When the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and ate it. She also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate it. Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they realized they were naked, so they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. What can we learn from the fact that the first sin was eating a piece of fruit? Did you ever really think about this? Good for the eye. It's your eye <laughs> so maybe here, here's my line of thought. We, we really like to think that there's some sins that are worse than others, right? Yeah. We, re we know that's not true, but we really like to think that. Right. At least I'm not doing that or that. Okay, so on, on our human list of worse sins, you know, better to worse sins, where would eating a piece of fruit fall <laughs> on that list? And, and so if you ever, you know, if ever someone said, well, it's just a little, a little sin, Right? Just a little white lie or however we talk. It's not this this little thing. It's not a big deal. You could say, you know, the first sin was eating one piece of fruit. Why was it such an awful thing? So it had these impacts of opening their eyes and feeling ashamed. But it was bad because it was against what God said. <laughs> And ultimately, that's at the root of sin. There's all sorts of sinful things and actions and thoughts. But what's at the root that really is the bad thing? It's I'm disobeying God. Right? And so if you disobey God by eating a piece of fruit, or you disobey God by blowing up a building, in God's eyes, they're exactly <coughs> the same. Because the sin is disobey God. And so when the devil persisted in his temptation... Eve fell to that temptation and she disobeyed God and she took some fruit and this shows us just how serious every sin is. Every sin is serious to God. And where was Adam? He's right there. Did he not hear the conversation? He must have heard the conversation. <laughs> and this is where it's hard to understand. Like, why didn't Adam say something? Okay, why was Eve the one who spoke to the serpent? Why didn't Adam jump in? Right? Or after that first temptation, why didn't one of the two of them say, you know, let's go away from the tree with the talking snake in it. Let's, <laughs> let's just remove ourselves from whatever's happening here. Why didn't they do any of that? And we don't understand why. Adam was on the other side of the tree, couldn't hear it. He was, <laughs> maybe he was hard of hearing. I mean, he was a man, so he just, that, he was a perfect, it was a perfect world, though. So it wasn't that he was hard of hearing. Right? And so Adam is right there, and he takes some and he eats it too. And immediately, everything changed. Okay? This is why I say that I don't think you can say Eve sinned with that first response, because nothing happened. But now Adam and Eve, they actually sin. They covet the fruit and they take and eat it. And what happens? First, they realize they're naked. So what feeling do they have? Shame. Shame and guilt. Shame and guilt. And now they have been naked the whole time. So what feeling have they never felt before? 
the shame and guilt, the moment that they sinned, suddenly they felt shame and they felt guilt. And this is where, when that first sin comes in the world, suddenly everything changes. Right? And it's not like God sent fireballs down from heaven. It was almost worse than that. It was this inside them. They had this deep realization, oh, everything is different. We disobey God, and now everything is different. Is it fair to say that they now, now know the difference between good and evil? So that's where the devil, he says, you know, if you eat this fruit, you'll know good and evil. And he was right. And so, you know, the devil, he likes to say half true things, right? That was the, the true part. The problem is, what are they knowing before? Just good. Just good. And so the devil said, oh, you're missing. You're missing a really important thing. You're, what they were really missing, though, was evil. And so now they knew good and evil. And it wasn't a good thing. And you almost wonder, you know, for us today, we don't know good like they knew good. And so as much as sin impacts us today, I wonder if, for Adam and Eve, there was even this this extra this extra hurt inside. <coughs> we know what perfect good is, and now we lost that. Right? It was a huge change. Hey? So I was just going to add a couple of things that wrong, but it wasn't so much eating the fruit, more or less she broke the first commandment, which didn't exist at the time. But you can't break any of the commandments without breaking the first commandment as well. And the idea that she could be like God or elevate something to be like God would be basically thou shalt have no other gods. Yeah, excellent. And so, kind of like we wonder, well, why did those angels rebel against God? And it must have been something like we're not content to be God's creatures. We want to be more than what God's made us to be. And it seemed like that was the case for Eve too. Well, huh, I only know good. God knows good and evil. That's not fair. It would be better for me to know to know both. And I think, so, you say, well, what was the sin? The Bible talks about the sin was that they took the fruit and ate it. And so that was, that was the sinful action. But, of course, behind it is not trusting God in His Word, desiring something that God didn't want them to have. There's all these sinful desires that are behind it. It's ultimately this rejection of God. That was their sin. Somehow I put the same slide on there twice. Mm -hmm. Kind of kicking myself because I got to the end and I wanted one more slide, but I didn't have space for it. <laughs> and there it was. There was the space I needed. I had one more slide on the end. I wanted, there's got to be 24, so it fits on four pages, six on a page. And I couldn't just add one more and then print a whole other page off. All right. We're going to continue a little further, but before we do, this is, again, one of the stories of the Bible that people say, there's no way that actually happened. So you're saying that there was a snake that talked, and the snake that talked got Adam and Eve to eat a piece of fruit, and then the whole world changed? Like, are you crazy? Okay, clearly this was not a real story. This is what people will say, right? Just to answer that, remember what, what we said we should do if the devil said that God really say? How should we answer that? Using what? With God's word. Okay, if, if somebody, especially if they're a Christian, and they come to you and say, well, you know, that story about Adam and Eve and that Garden of Eden, you don't have to believe that. Right? Here's some places that you could point to. 2 Corinthians 11, verse 3. The Apostle Paul writes, but I'm afraid that just as Eve was deceived by the serpent's cunning, your minds may somehow be led astray from your sincere and pure devotion to Christ. Thousands of years later, as Paul's writing the New Testament, what is he saying in this verse? There's temptation. There's temptation just like what? So he's... Not, not only does Paul not say, you know that story about Eve and the snake, it's kind of just a myth. Paul says, no, actually, that's a real thing, and I'm worried that it's happening today. And that, it's snowballing. 
and snowballing, just like Eve was deceived by the serpent, there's a danger for you and there's a danger for us as Christians to be led astray by the devil's cunning. Okay, and so far from, oh, this is just a legend. It's, this is something that really happened and watch out, it's happening today too. All right, another place, 1 Timothy 2. We read this last time, talking about Adam and Eve. I do not permit a woman to teach her to assume authority over a man. She must be quiet. For Adam was formed first, then Eve. And Adam was not the one deceived. It was the woman who was deceived and became a sinner. And so much, this is the verse that leads us to say that we should have men who are the, the leaders or the head in churches and homes. And we said last time that it goes back to how God created Adam first, then Eve. But then there's a second thing. According to these verses, is the story about Eve being deceived by the serpent, is it true? Yes. Absolutely. Okay, and it has impacts for God's people. So then did then Eve deceived Adam to take the bite so the apple and eat of it also? What this leads us to say is clearly Eve was the one who sinned first, and then she gives it to Adam, and she leads Adam to sin too. Okay? Before we get too carried away, though, here's what Romans 5 says. It says, For if by the trespass of the one man, death reigned through that one man, how much more will those who receive God's abundant provision of grace and of the gift of righteousness reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ? Paul is comparing two men. Who are the two men he's comparing? Adam and Jesus. Notice, even though Eve was the first to sin, okay, who ultimately does the Bible say bears responsibility? Adam does. Okay, so no, no men should ever go around and say, oh, it's all women's fault. That's, that's not what the Bible is teaching us to do. Okay, so the Bible does say if Eve was the one who was deceived first, Eve was the one who found the sin, but... Death came through a man, Adam. But the good news is life comes through a man, Jesus. And so now if we were to say, well, you know, all those stories about Adam, that's just a legend, that's just a myth, didn't actually happen. What happens to this verse? So if this man is a myth, what about this one? He's a myth The Bible goes together, right? So the Bible actually says, Adam was a real person because of Adam's actions. Every human being has been impacted. And this is why Jesus, another real person, just like Adam was, he came to undo what Adam did. Adam came and he brought death. Jesus came so that he would bring us life. Right? So what Adam did, Jesus came to undo the first man and the second man. Any questions about that? Yeah, sure. Well, I think that brought, was, was it he because Adam let his wife be tempted and keep the fruit? So, that have been the first sin? Th this is where there's, again, there's so much more sometimes we wish the Bible would say. Yeah. So you just look at what happens as Eve is being tempted and when we understand that Adam is to be the head of his family, right? That's what the Bible says. You see, why isn't Adam stopping us? Why isn't he stepping in? Why doesn't he, you know, help Eve out? Or beyond that, why doesn't he just talk to the serpent himself? And so, this is kind of reading between the lines, but people say it doesn't seem like Adam was really being a godly husband or a godly leader as all this happens. But would we even know if Adam was right with her? Was it says he was with her. So, it's just part, that's verse 6. She also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate it. And so, it's just simply, he's right there. And this is again, it's, it's, the Bible doesn't spell this all out. Okay, so Eve is responsible for, for taking that fruit and eating it. But God also says that Adam's responsible too. And how that could be, it's not hard to see. Well, why didn't, you know, you're there together. Maybe she took the fruit first, but... There could have been something you could have done to help all this from happening. 
Right? We're going to go a little further. We're not going to finish the chapter. But let's just see a little bit more what changes because of sin. So the next verse is 8 to 10. Then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And they hid from the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man, Where are you? He answered, I heard you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid. So kind of sad verses, but as I was reading what people have written about them, somebody said, Here we see the grace of God. Maybe that's not your first thought. They seem like really sad verses. But how in these in these verses do we see the grace of God? He's calling them. And even, we could go even further. What's he doing? Walking there with them. He's seeking them. And it really is quite an amazing thing that when human beings sin, what does God do? He searches for them. He calls to them. He cares about them. He loves them. Okay, and now, just a little bit ago, we talked about what God did when the angels rebelled. He did something different. When the angels rebelled, what did he do? He cast them out of hell, heaven and created hell for them. Notice that God, for whatever reason, doesn't do that with Adam and Eve. And the only explanation could be grace. And so for the devil and the demons, the Bible doesn't hold out any hope. They rebelled against God. They're going to be punished eternally for that. But human beings, God treats us by grace in a different way. He searches for Adam and Eve. He calls to them. How do we explain this if we believe God is a spirit? Yeah, so he's walking in the garden in the cool of the day and we can't explain it any more than what it says. And so, yeah, did they, did they see God in some kind of a form? We know it doesn't say that. We don't know. But they, it says they could hear him, right? They could hear the sound. So what does God walking through the garden sound like? And we don't know. Is it a wind? Is it? We don't know. But it, what's interesting is it seems like this was a regular occurrence. It seems like this wasn't the first time. Like, they, they knew what the sound of God walking in the garden was like. It just makes it, we can't imagine this perfect world. They had this perfect relationship with God. And somehow that involved this close kind of communication with God that maybe we don't have quite the same way today. Right? So God calls to them. We also see how sin wrecks our relationship with God. Uh, maybe for us today, we see, this sounds pretty cool. God's walking in the garden, calling to you. That sounds like a good thing, doesn't it? And what do Adam and Eve do? Hide. Hide. And this is what sin does. It wrecks our relationship with God. And again, we're not told, you know, what happened the, the other times God walked in the garden. It seems like this is something that happened before. And you imagine Adam and Eve would just come running out to... Hey, God, it's time for our evening walk. This is great. Right? We're just trying to picture things that we don't understand. But suddenly, because of sin, they hide. And what is it that you and I are first tempted to do whenever we, we do something wrong? Hide it. Sometimes it's like physically hiding ourselves. But more often, it's trying to hide whatever it is that we did, right? You do something wrong and you're first thought, how do I hide this? Okay, and usually we only confess it if there's no way to hide it. <laughs> right, how do I, how do I cover this up so nobody knows? And it goes right back to Adam and Eve in Garden Eden. Verse nine, somebody said, God asks a teaching question. So God calls out to Adam and he says, where are you? Was God asking that because he needed to find where Adam was? No, of course not. And so the whole purpose behind the questions is... He already knew. He already knew. He's trying to draw them out. That way they have to show their shame and be... 
Excellent. So God's doing all of this for them. He's not, well, I wonder where they are. I mean, let's see. Where are you at? He, he knows exactly where they are, but he's, he's I wonder how good of a hiding spot they had. I don't know. But he, he's doing this for them. Right? He wants them to come out and to talk and to confess and repent. And, okay, he's doing all this to teach them. How would you rate Adam's answer? Well, I heard you in the garden. I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid. So, that's interesting, Randy. He is actually telling the truth. Kind of. He's just conveniently avoiding the main thing that needs to be talked about, right? So every word he says is true. I heard you in the garden. I was afraid because I was naked, so I had. He's just avoiding the actual thing that God wants to draw out of him, which would be, God, I'm sorry. You don't hear Adam say that. All right? We're going to read one more section, 11 to 13, and that's where we'll stop. Verse 11, and he said, Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree that I commanded you not to eat from? And the man said, The woman you put here with me, she gave me some fruit from the tree, and I ate it. And the Lord God said to the woman, What is this you have done? The woman said, The serpent deceived me, and I ate. And this is just where it gets sad. Instead of repenting, Adam, what does he do? Blames Eve. And now, what was the very, the, the previous story that just happened before this? You can look in your Bible. What happens right before all this? It's very joyful that it happens. God makes Eve, and how does Adam feel? This is great. He gives that really romantic poem, right? This is bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh, and he's happy, and now all of a sudden, he's ready to throw her into the bus. Right? Not my fault, it's Eve. And instead of repenting, Eve she blames the serpent. Well, not really my fault. It was a serpent, he tricked me. Right? Not my fault. And this is where we can see ourselves, right? Instead of repenting, we we make excuses. We find someone else to blame. And of course it's sad because God isn't actually looking for us to somehow make things better. What is he looking for us to do? To repent. To say that we're sorry. And this is growing as a Christian, is being able to say the words, I'm sorry. And that's something we need God, the Holy Spirit, to work in our hearts. But to, to learn to take responsibility for our own sins. Right? This is something we want God to create in each of us. Because when Adam and Eve blame somebody else, does that actually help anything? No. It just must have hurt their relationship, I'm sure. Right? But what God wants us to do is repent and find forgiveness in Jesus. Okay, we've got a lot more to go for in this chapter yet, but just to recap for tonight, what are the familiar results of sin that we see in this story? We said that when we look around at the world, other than Gainette, we don't see a perfect world. But Gainette does. That's okay. We're not going to try to break it for her. But all of us, we just see this, we see a world that's not perfect, and it's filled with blaming other people, shame, guilt, separation from God, tragedies, hiding, covering things up, and Right? When you hear the Bible describe this, then you look around and you see that. That's exactly what the world's like. And it's all selfishness. And selfishness, yeah. Which is just running through all of this. Okay, now we've been talking about creation and evolution. I guess it got kind of off there. We're talking about creation and evolution as we're going through this. Just from what we heard today, Explain this. The Bible explains the world around us so much better than evolution does. You know what evolution says, right? Evolution is everything is always progressing. That's a big evolution word. And 
What direction is it progressing? It's getting better. And so the whole theory of evolution is there's there's this you know one thing, there's this mess, there's this chaos, and little by little, things are getting better and more intelligent and more complicated and better and better and better and better. And the problem is, if you look at our world, is the world getting better and better and better and better and better? And I mean, there's truth that God is allowing human beings to develop technologies. There's inventions that are happening, but none of that hides the fact that the world is not becoming a better and better and better and better and better place. It's becoming more sinful. It's becoming more sinful. And the, the Bible says the opposite. The Bible says the world started out up here. That it was perfect. And then sin came into the world, and so the world is going like this. Because the more people there are, there are, the more sin that there is, and the more sin that there, it just compounds on itself. And this, I think, is one of the huge problems of evolution. There's so many of them, but this idea, yep, the world, it's, it's just becoming a better and better place. And you think, but that's not true. Even if you think, well, we human beings, we're just becoming better and better people, aren't we? No. You say, no, that's not true either. The Bible story about it started out perfect, and then our human sin is what's making the world more and more full of sin. That's that's the reality. We could end there. That would be kind of sad. So let's not quite end there yet. Here's one verse. You'll recognize this. This is what we use at church all the time when we confess our sins. But I think it's such a powerful verse. Here is the solution. If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. And this is really at the heart of the Bible's message. We've, we've done what Adam and Eve did a thousand times. Not just the sinning part, but the blaming and the shame and the guilt part. And God sent us a solution, and it's Jesus. And so the Bible says, you know, if, if you go through life not confessing your sins, you're just lying to yourself. But when you confess your sins, God is faithful, and he forgives you. And that's what our hope is. And so as Christians, we don't have to pretend that we're better than we are. We don't have to hide the things that we're ashamed of. On the contrary, God says, bring those to me. Know that Jesus on the cross took all of those away. You're forgiven. This is what gives us peace. Any questions on what we've gone through today? Dave? I have lots. Too many. So maybe oh, well, give us a couple. Okay, well, maybe not lots, but at least a couple of them. So, in Jesus' ministry, he casts out demons. So demons are fallen angels. Mm -hmm. In Jude and Second Peter, it talks about kept in darkness with everlasting chains to the day of judgment. So, are there really bad ones that are chained up and the ones that are not as powerful, roaming the earth, and killing people, and possessing people? How's that work? So, these are great questions. And it goes into this category of the Bible doesn't tell us everything we want to know about spirits. So I've heard some people suggest that maybe what you said last there is true. Maybe there are some demons who are just confined to hell forever. And some that, for whatever reason, God allows access to earth. I've also heard some, the Bible will talk about this chain. And maybe the way that we should think about it is it's like that chain has a certain length to it. And so they're chained in hell, but from hell, they're able to, to access earth. And so their, their judgment, it's not like they're not being judged, but kind of like a dog that on a leash can go a certain distance, that, that God allows the devil and his demons to, to, to go a certain distance. They can't do something that, that goes beyond what God allows to happen. But they do have authority and power in some ways here on earth. But in Job, for instance, we know that Satan is in heaven, right? 
So in Job, we hear about Satan going up into heaven. This is where, you remember, we studied the book of Revelation. You remember everything we talked about, right? As we went through Revelation. You do, yeah. So in Revelation chapter 12, we hear about this battle between Michael and the devil, and the devil being thrown out of heaven. And the way that it's in Revelation 12, it doesn't sound like that's what happened at the beginning of the world. It sounds like that was happening as Jesus was on earth. Revelation 12 says there's this woman who gives birth to a child, and the devil tries to get the child, and God takes the child up to heaven. It's talking about Jesus, and then there's this war in heaven, and Michael throws the devil out. And so this is all, again, we're talking in about things that are beyond our total understanding. But what people suggest is perhaps in the days of Job, the devil was able to still somehow go into heaven to the presence of God. And this is perhaps the change that took place after and during Jesus' work on earth, was the devil was cast out of heaven, and this time, for good. He can't go back to heaven. He can't go to accuse somebody, because we have Jesus and his blood and his righteousness that covers all of us. And so again, we're, we're trying to understand as much as we can, but it would seem like there was a second casting of the devil totally out of heaven due to Jesus' work on earth. And now the devil he obviously can still impact us on earth, but he can't go to heaven to accuse you anymore. Perhaps it was when Jesus said, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. And that was after he sent his disciples out preaching the gospel. And so through the, the gospel message of salvation in Jesus, that ultimately led to the the devil's further defeat. And of course, what we're waiting for is Judgment Day. That's when the big dragon is going to be thrown into that lake of burning sulfur and he's not going to be able to tempt anybody ever again. One final one on Judgment Day. Uh -huh. We know that on Judgment Day we'll be reunited with our bodies, but yet they'll be, they'll be righteous, they'll be holy, they'll be a spirit, so they'll be a perfected body, if you will. Yeah. And spirit and body will be reunited. Yeah. Those souls in hell of human beings who go there, are they going to be reunited with a body? Uh, we, it sounds like yes. Only yeah. living in hell. Yeah, so uh, like when in Matthew 25, this idea of separating the sheep from the goats, it seems like the people are in the same condition. And so this idea in hell, what's, what's awful about hell isn't just that you, you burn up for a little while, it's that it never ends. So it's kind of the book of Isaiah in the Old Testament is filled with beautiful promises, but the last verses of Isaiah talk about a place where a worm does not die. And so those who are against God are going to the place where a worm does not die. And that certainly makes us think about they're going to have a physical body too. It's just it's going to be eternally tormented. And we don't like to think about this, but this is why we need Jesus. That's what we deserve. We deserve hell. And we need Jesus and his salvation. It's too bad the devil didn't repent. <laughs> yes, yeah, so it's just too bad the devil didn't repent. That's where we don't know if that's even possible. It seems like God gives human beings the ability to repent. But nowhere in the Bible do we hear about another chance for angels. Mm -hmm. And so this is where it's like God has shown us grace beyond even the angels, which is just amazing to think about. It is. God gives us time to repent and believe. We want to take advantage of that time. Already saw it, not too hard. So maybe that's why. I mean, they already saw heaven and they turned away from it. And so God, God doesn't give them a second chance. We can't, can't explain that perfectly. But if you and I are alive and God's giving us a chance to repent, this is a gift of God's grace. Great questions. You'll notice we still have a lot to go in the chapter. What comes next is God giving consequences of sin to the devil and to Eve and to Adam, and then we see them expelled from the Garden of Eden. So I thought instead of trying to rush through the whole chapter tonight, we take it in two sections. So next time... We'll review this quickly, and then we'll get into what did God say to them to, to give them consequences for their sins.
So come back next week. We close with a prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, this is a, a sobering and sad part of your word because we see how your perfect creation got ruined through sin. It'd be easy for us to say what well, we're having thinking, except we have to confess we've done the same thing. We know your word, we know your will. And so often in our lives we've we've rejected you. We thought that maybe sin would be better or funner. And beyond that, when we sin, we haven't just confessed that sin and turned to you. Instead we've Try to hide it or blame someone else, and we know what it feels to feel guilty and ashamed and lost. And we're thankful, Heavenly Father, that you didn't just end everything right there. Instead, you promised to send Jesus, our Savior. We know that he died on the cross to take our sins away. We pray, Lord, that your forgiveness give us peace and joy each day. We also pray that you lead more and more people to hear and to believe this message. That in a world filled with sin, there's hope and there's forgiveness in you. Please be with each one of us through the rest of this week. Protect us and our families. Give us repentant hearts each day that trust in you. In Jesus' name we pray.